Well, it is just a few minutes before 7 o'clock. We are expecting a couple of other guests. There's seven or eight name tags out there, but uh, I think it's okay if we get started. Uh, first, thanks, everybody, for being here. I'm David O'Leary from the Aero Club of New England. I'm the vice president of the Aero Club, and I am so thrilled to welcome you and all to our first in-person icebreaker in some time. If you're happy to be here, applaud, shout, hoot and holler, whatever you like. Yeah, it's great to be together. Uh, it's great to be together and in person again. Uh, we're also very thrilled to welcome author uh, Francie Noldi tonight to speak about her book, She Looked to the Sky, and about her mother, Frances Dean Wilcox Noldi. We're going to introduce Francie in just a moment or two, but she is delightful, and I know you're going to love her. Where'd my clicker go? Did I leave that over here? Oh, sorry. There we go. Um, how, how many Aero Club members are, are here tonight? If you are an Aero Club member, raise your hand. That's great. How many recent Aero Club members are there within the last six months? Yes, yes, great. Thank you, thank you, thank you for registering and becoming a member and joining us. Thank you also for being here tonight. Um, we are an organization, the Aero Club of New England, that values things like this, right? The social aspects of aviation getting together. We do flyouts, we do icebreakers like this. Uh, it's just great to be around other pilots and other people who like pilots and planes and, and aviation. I've heard and overheard so many great stories here tonight, just in the last hour or so. So it's, it's wonderful to be together. Um, we also put forth a number of educational and safety programs uh, throughout the year to make flying safer for everybody. Next month, we're going to present our annual crash course. That is going to be March 15th at the Burlington Marriott. If you've been, you know what an incredible event it is. Uh, we'll have the New England Administrator of the FAA, Colleen D'Alessandro, is going to join us. Stephen K. Brown from the FAA's FAST team will be there to speak and do a sort of a presentation of uh, regional incidents and accidents throughout the, the past year or so. And then Richard McSpadden, who is the Senior Vice President of AOPA's Air Safety Institute, will be there as well to present. It is a free event. It is a really worthwhile event. And you can register at acone.com. That's A-C-O-N-E.com. And we hope that you will join us. Um, we also do a number of scholarships. Um, our organization uh, generously funds a number of scholarships each year for new aviators and those who are pursuing careers in aviation. Since 1984, this organization that you're a member of, ACON, has financially assisted scores of New England students enrolled in aviation training programs totaling over $570,000, which is a lot of money through the years. Your membership, your being here tonight as a member makes that possible, so we thank you for that. Uh, if you are not a member, but would like to find out more about this organization, you can leave your name. Charlie Burris is here. Charlie, just raise your hands, everybody. You don't know Charlie. He's our membership director. Georgia Pappas is. Anybody who's from the board or an advisor of ACON, just raise your hand so we can all happy to tell you all you need to know and probably some things you don't want to know uh, about the Aero Club of New England. So we'd love to have you. Uh, we'd love to have you join us. We are really, really thrilled to welcome tonight's speaker. Francie actually never learned to fly. However, her mother's influence finally pushed her to share the memories and stories of her mom's life and what stories they are in the hope that they might motivate, motivate other women to fly, both literally and figuratively. Francie has spent her life as a teacher, as a proponent of co-education, as a businesswoman, and so much more. She's also extremely active in encouraging sustainability and combating climate change and many, many other worthy causes. She is the author of She Looked to the Sky, The Remarkable Life of a Pioneer Aviator. Please join me in welcoming Francie Noldi. Good evening. What a fabulous audience you are. I have never felt so welcomed. And it's just lovely that you made the effort to come and I appreciate that so much. I'm very grateful to be here to talk with you about She Looked to the Sky. And I want to express my thanks to David for inviting me with such heartfelt enthusiasm. And I want to thank John Godfrey, whom I hope all of you know, for letting David know about the book and for writing a delightful and engaging review. Thank you, John. I also want to thank my husband, Hugh Fort Miller, who edited the book and learned his craft as John Godfrey's high school English teacher. Aww. What kind of a student was he? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote this book with two audiences in mind. First, my family, of course, 
and family friends to record as much as I could about my mother's life so it wouldn't get lost, doing the best I could from the memory of a young girl. The second group is you, the people in this room, who love the adventure and the seriousness of aviation and flying, just as my mother did, always building and expanding upon your knowledge no matter how experienced you are, loving the view of the world and familiar territory from above, thrilling someone by taking them up in a small plane for the first time. And I heard David talk about that with you. So it's true. <laughs> Taking trips wherever you want to go. Airplane models. That's what my brother loved. The look of your airplane. The challenge of taking off or landing with a crosswind. All creating a mystique about flying that's contagious. How can you not love all that? Mother did. She Looked to the Sky is an unusual combination of biography and memoir. At my first meeting with our book designer, she asked me what I was writing about. When I explained it was a biography of my mother, she turned and said, it will be as much about you, Francie, as about your mother. I balked at that thought, but she was right, as you will see. The readings will illustrate some of the major themes of the book. Mother was a pioneer aviator who became a strong voice for women during World War II and a leader in civil aviation during the Cold War. When interacting with her children, her attention focused directly and indirectly on the importance of education and independence. Some of the stories illustrate the conflict between her public and private life and her willingness to go along with newspaper reporters who portrayed her as a gorgeous homemaker, mother of seven, who happened to take up flying. <laughs> mother was smart, beautiful, and manipulative. Most people were putty in her hands, of which she took full advantage. Complex, cosmopolitan, complicated, she led a fascinating life that I've tried to capture along with her impact on me and others around her. At 16, she entered Oberlin College to pursue a career as an opera star, only to leave in the first semester when her mother became terminally ill. After her mother died that summer, her father forbade her to return to Oberlin, insisting she stay close to home by going to Syracuse University something she never forgave him for, ever. Now to the book. I will begin from a section called Broadway Dreams. As she was graduating from Syracuse in 1923, Franny was thinking of marrying her college sweetheart, Karki Brown. In April, they applied for a marriage certificate, but they didn't use it. As a fine pianist and teacher, she became a supervisor of music in the public schools of Orange, New Jersey. But that job was short-lived, as operatic and theatrical dreams called her to Broadway. Franny joined the ensemble of Lady Be Good, George and Ira Gershwin's first Broadway hit, starring Fred Astaire and his sister, Adele. It's not clear how long a run Franny, Franny had during the show's 330 performances between 1924 and 1925, but we do know that she next joined the cast of The Best of Us, which opened in Cincinnati, moved to Detroit, and after a two-week run, closed. Twenty-five years later, Franny told the Philadelphia Inquirer magazine, on the last night in Detroit, the scenery fell down and hit the stage manager. That was the crowning blow. <laughs> the show folded and so did my career. She married Karki in the mid-twenties. They had a daughter, Sally, but Franny soon divorced Karki because of his alcoholism. 
She then starred in the title role of NBC's radio soap opera, Gloria Gay's Affairs. My father, Hans, whose wife had left him with four children, heard her melodious voice and insisted a mutual friend introduce him to Franny. They met, and it wasn't long before she was headed to Reading, PA, in the early 30s, to live in a mansion that was soon filled with seven children, living at Punch's Run, an estate whose 725 acres the state of Pennsylvania bought in the late 1960s, and is now known as the Noldy Forest Environmental and Education Center. My father's interest in aviation manifested when he helped establish Redding's first airport. Taking flying lessons himself, he must have convinced mother to try her luck. She immediately fell in love with flying. I will read how that affected her and me. This section is called Mother Flies. At the age of 39, with a brood of seven children, from little ones to young adults, mother began flying lessons. In the summer of 1941, I was four and a half. I climbed onto the radiator in my brother Jake's room to look out the window to watch mother get into her black Buick convertible with red leather seats and slowly gain momentum around the front circle to drive off. While I cried and cried and called for her not to go, no one heard me or responded to my tears. She was on her way to the Reading Airport. Each day was the same. I feared she would not return. And when she came home at night, I knew I would have to watch her leave again. It took me months to outgrow this pain. When World War II prompted gas rationing, mother soon stopped, stopped driving her Buick and bought a flashy motor scooter with a sidecar. <laughs> when the war broke out, mother devoted her time and energy to the war effort through piloting. And daddy's textile factory was manufacturing products for soldiers and classified weaponry 24-7. This is from the chapter, Responding to War. Early in 1942, Franny joined the Civil Air Patrol as a charter member of Reading Squadron 22. In October, she became Reading's CAP courier commander, the first woman in the nation to hold such a position. Hans bought Franny a succession of planes, starting with Piper Cubs, much like the one that her good friend Bevo Howard, the aerobatic stunt pilot, flew, then a larger Fairchild 24 to accommodate her role in the CAP, and finally Ryan Navion's seven in all, called Reposa. I have notes that tell me when it's a good idea to have a sip of water. This next section is from a chapter called Powder Puff Derby. Franny competes. In 1948, after flying for seven years, mother decided to enter the Powder Puff Derby, an all-women's transcontinental air race. She had become so well known as an outstanding pilot that the manufacturer of Ryan Navion hoped to promote sales by asking Franny to race their newest single-engine plane 2,500 miles from Palm Springs, California to Miami, Florida. She was thrilled to see the inscription on the side, Ryan Navion, Aviation Consultants, Inc., Reading, PA. She had become the consultant's director of public relations. Sleek with low-slung wings, the maroon plane overshadowed the others with its power and maneuverability. It was the best plane she'd ever flown. 
As they set off from Palm Springs, they were flying a straight line to Tucson, but into headwinds of 40 miles per hour, unusual for flights heading east. In her journal, she writes, Tucson radio reported severe thunderstorms in the El Paso area, which coupled with headwinds would have allowed me too little margin of gasoline to weave around storms or to return to another airport. I whipped into a small field a few miles ahead, gassed the airplane, and was off in eight minutes. The headwinds continued and so did the reports of thunderstorms. I began to see them a hundred miles west of El Paso. It looked like great columns of rain pouring out of a boiling mass of cumulus clouds. Zigzag stripes of lightning appeared, so bright that it took my breath away. But the storms were scattered enough for me to bypass them, and I approached El Paso from the south with a great blackness hovering over the west of the city. Franny landed safely to learn that the next pass was closed. The pilots decided to take off the next morning and get some sleep. Up again at 3 a.m. and on the runway at dawn, Franny didn't see the other pilots again until they met in Miami. She flew above the next mountain pass by climbing to 14,000 feet over broken clouds, but she still faced headwinds. Then she noticed, as she wrote in her journal, the engine wasn't purring quite so smoothly. The carburetor heat and mixture control didn't help any. No, it wasn't my imagination. A magneto check gave me a thrill. The left one was completely out. I was chugging along nicely on the right one, and although brakes, in the, in, although brakes began to appear in the clouds beneath me, I decided to stay with my flight plan, which took me to Waco, Texas. Over San Angelo, the clouds became scattered, and soon after that, the sky was clear. I stayed up there at 14,000 until I could see Waco, then started a slow letdown that would still give me plenty of gliding range if the right magneto got too tired. At four minutes past nine, I taxied up to the Waco Aviation School hangar where the chief mechanic and two others went to work at once on the magneto. She continues to write, by that evening, C-4304K was ready to go. With true Texas hospitality, Floyd Gray, president of Waco Aviation, had coffee with me at 4 a.m., drove me to the airport, pushed the airplane out of the hangar, checked the weather, and waved me good luck as I taxied out. One stop between there and Miami would do it, and a crosswind landing at Pensacola brought me close to the gas pit, saving several precious minutes. I was out of there in practically no time, and up to 15,000 feet I went, where at long last I had a good tail boost. A whiff of oxygen at intervals from my tiny portable oxygen bottle kept me awake and aware. And at that altitude, I felt perfectly safe in cutting a corner of the gulf over Cross City, then direct to a point just east of Palm Beach where I started the letdown, which clocked me over the east-west runway of Amelia Earhart Field in Miami at 1422 EST. Cumulative time for the entire trip was 1710, which, despite headwinds that prevailed throughout the first part of the trip, gave me an average of 150 miles per hour, the exact speed at which I was handicapped. With the race over, Earhart's mother emerged to welcome Franny to Amelia Earhart Field. Franny, on bended knee on the wing of her plane, reached out to shake hands with Mrs. Earhart. By then, Franny knew, she had won the race. <laughs> Cheers. This next section returns to Mother Flies. <coughs> when in the air, Franny said she was in heaven. Does that sound familiar? 
often alone in total repose with all the household worries below. While well, she often said she learned to fly in order to surpass her father's accomplishments in racing papers, pacers or to keep up with her children who were sure to become pilots, she finally admitted she loved being in the sky as a peaceful relief from the melee of seven children. The reasons didn't matter. She found her place in the blue skies. She was addicted. When I was graduating from high school, boarding school, the whole school gathered outside ready to march to the baccalaureate service, seniors first in their caps and gowns. Mother was late. Her solution was to buzz the school, circling very low several times, tipping her wings to salute the occasion. Despite my embarrassment, students and faculty cheered and waved as she flew by. Oh, mother. <laughs> In a section called Heroin, Myths, and Family Stories, I wrote a short vignette, Daddy Shirts, that needs a context. Mother felt she had to portray herself as a domestic woman, something the culture expected of her. And because of the war, I was sent away to boarding school at the age of six. During my early years, I was already looking for deeper meanings in the punches run woods, pondering nature for answers. This story relates to some of those challenges. Daddy's shirts. Two newspapers quoted mother as saying she had to rush home from winning the Powder Puff Derby to do laundry for the children. That was nonsense. <laughs> One spring vacation, I asked if we could go to church on Easter morning. We never went to church, but schoolmates talked about their religions, and I was fascinated. Mother said we couldn't go because she had to iron daddy's shirts. <laughs> even though I knew she never did. In response, I quietly got up at five in the morning, found Daddy's shirts in the ironing basket, and began to iron them. I created scorches <laughs> and creases, but I did the best a little girl could. When Mother woke up, I told her, we can go to church because I had ironed all Daddy's shirts. Mother quietly relented by driving Chris, my brother, and me into the city, leaving us at some cathedral-like building, telling us she'd be back to pick us up in an hour. After my parents were divorced in 1952, we left Punch's Run, and Mother found the perfect job in Washington as Director of General Aviation for the Department of Commerce. The next section is called Preparing for World War III and describes her role. She was responsible for planning the mobilization of commercial and private planes in case of a national emergency, a euphemism for war. She counted on these planes to reinforce and support military war efforts. Overall, she was responsible for the Civil Air Reserve Fleet and the National Emergency Air Fleet Plan. One tattered newspaper clipping begins with a headline, Over Entire U.S. Woman Heads Air Mobilization. So let me sum up Franny's career as a pioneer pilot. She started out as a World War II Civil Air Patrol commander was a winner of an early transcontinental all-women's air race, and eventually became a full colonel in the CAP, the highest rank allowed a woman. She was in charge of the women's program. She ran the Reading Air Show, which became the best in the nation. Her hometown named their airport after her in 1950. When she moved to DC, she became responsible for planning how America's civilian airplanes would defend the country should the Cold War become hot. Always a proponent for women aviators, she believed in women's capabilities and her own capabilities to be leaders. So thank you for letting me share these portions of the book with you. And I hope you have comments and questions.
1948 race? The question is, did she do any other races aside from the one in 1948? She did one more, 1949. She came in third because she had a very heavy handicap. I believe. She also had a very good friend become, um, her name was Vi Delp, became her co-pilot. It was the first uh, race she was solo. Yeah. Yeah. Her co-pilot might have slowed her down a knot. Yes. That's true. A little extra weight. <laughs> yes. Um, you mentioned seven kids. Did any of your siblings uh, get into flying? Did any of the seven kids, my siblings, get into flying? Not right away. Um, my mother invited my sister Sally and my brother Jake to join the um, Civil Air Patrol one summer, and so they did that. Um, but they didn't really learn to fly. Uh, my, I have one full brother. As I, as I said, my father had four children. My mother had one child. So when they got married, they had five children, instant family of five, and then they had my brother Chris and me. Um, my brother Chris loved everything about airplanes, uh, as well as baseball. And he, um, he, he made model airplanes constantly. So as an adult, he went into the Army and he tried to join the Air Force. And he learned that he was colorblind. So he was really very disappointed, but, it, but actually it explained why he always came home with an empty bucket when we went to collect strawberries, wild strawberries, because he couldn't tell the difference between the strawberry red and the green leaf. And he came home with these empty buckets, and we'd say, you've eaten all the strawberries. I know you have. And he said, no, no, I haven't. I haven't. He was colorblind, poor soul. So he became a paratrooper instead. And then my sister Jeannie, who hightailed it out to Wyoming as soon as she graduated from college. She did learn to fly. And in the you know, very um, tumultuous winters in, in Wyoming, she would fly down to the Baja to get some relief from the weather. And she would, she'd fly from Wyoming to the beach and land the plane on the beach where her home was. And then she told me she would go for groceries. It was a four minute flight. <laughs> But I think, I think we disappointed my mother tremendously by not all of us flying. She expected it. Yes? How long did she keep the Navy on? <clears throat> uh, she kept her Navy on uh, into uh, the time when we were living in Washington. And then about five years later, she sold half of it to someone so that she'd have somebody to share the expenses and keep it flying, really. She was flying less and less with this job. And, um, and then she sold it in her early 70s. Did she get another plane or did she stop flying? No, she stopped flying. Yeah. Did you ever look up the tail number to see if it's still around? Never thought of doing that. Wait a minute. <laughs> Wait a minute. That was the end number. And you know, in, in um, just one sec, in, in Reading, Pennsylvania, there is um, uh, an air museum, a mid-Atlantic air museum, and they have Navions there of the vintage that my mother flew, but not her, not her plane. What's the tail number? I think it was, uh, wasn't it 4304K? 04K. Take another question. Yeah, right. While you do that, yeah, Jen, you had a question. From a writer's standpoint, when yes. you do a memoir, um, did you consult any of your family in 
whether they either agreed or were offended or clearly this is from your point of view, but did it did any part of it create difficulties from the family standpoint? Clifford, the question is as a memoir. Did I consult with any family members about how they might have felt about what I, the stories I was telling? And, um, and how did that all work out? It was a f pretty interesting process. Mm -hmm. um, interesting. My brother is the only sibling left, so there are only two of us out of the seven children. And most of our cousins who, because we were the, you know, we were the, the caboose. We were the, the tail end of the, of the family. So our cousins were much older. Our brothers and sisters were older. There were, there were really not too many people. But I decided not to invite my brother to comment on anything. Um, because I knew that we would then get into his stories and his, what he wanted. And I, Chris, you have to write your own book because it'll be so different. And the other tricky part was that there were some incidents that were, were painful uh, for him. And um, when I think my husband, Hugh, actually was encouraging me. I think, Francie, it's about time that you talk to your brother. So in March, I called him and said, I, I really want to talk with you. He said, I can't. It's tax time. Uh, we'll talk in a couple months. So talk to you in May. And May came and went. So finally in June, I called him and said, we really do need to talk. I have to tell you about this book. And he gave me such a magnanimous response, was what I, I didn't dream I would hear him say, but thank you so much for doing this. And if you had asked me, we would have gotten bogged down and this story and that story, and I want you to put this in or take that out. And he said, you did the absolute right thing by just going ahead on your own. And um, he was so supportive and so generous. Yeah, it was really, it was, it, and I wasn't expecting that at all. So, yeah, yes. Having been based in Miami for many years, I have no recollection of where Amelia Earhart Field is or was or is today. I can't help you with that because I don't know either. <laughs> we have to research that one. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll Google that after. All right, right good. When you get that I one. I have the answer. You do, oh, we've got the answer to the airplane. Is it still existing? The Ryan Avion, was, uh, the certificate was issued on June 17, 1948. Uh, serial number was uh, 1304. And it was canceled. On December 22nd, 1970, reason for cancellation, canceled. So it sounds like it might have been an accident. Oh, dear. So he found the airplane. It definitely existed. It, it was built in June of 1948, which was the time of this air race. So that, that corresponds nicely. But then it was canceled in 1970, suggesting an accident. Oh, dear. Previous owner when it was canceled was a guy named Johnson Dwayne or Dwayne Johnson. I didn't have a comma in there. From Clifford, Pennsylvania. Okay. Right. Sounds familiar. I'm sorry that my back is no, to you. No, not at all. Isn't Dwayne the Rock Johnson the, the actor? Yeah. Right? Yes. Yeah. Might have been before he was born. Yeah. yeah. Is that Dwayne Johnson? Is that a thing? Yeah. Could be a different one. Yeah. I, I have a question, just following up on, the, on, on your question, which I thought was just great. How long were you, I know we, we published the book fairly recently. Yes. How long had you been marinating, working oh, right. on it? How long had it been in, in process that you were working on the book? Um, question is how long did I work on the book as, I was, as it was kind of fomenting? Um, my mother died at the age of 93 in 1995. And I agreed to bring home several boxes of her papers. And they were up in the attic for many, many years. And I went, I went through them about six years ago and started doing this, because I'm that kind of person. Get rid of what you don't need. And thank God I didn't throw away the things that became the basis for this book. But I, I could have done that just as easily, because it didn't seem, you know, who's interested in this? Didn't seem as if anybody was. 
And then, about three years ago, a friend, and I say this in, in the um, preface of the book, a friend gave a book about Pancho Barnes, the barnstormer, um, to some friends who they loved the book. And Francie, you got to read this book. It's really fun. I read the book, and I said, well, you know, my mother was a pilot. Oh, really? They didn't know that. And the woman who, the friend who gave the book, I said, my mother was a pilot. She said, I'm going to Google your mother, just like you just did. And she found some, a lot about my mother uh, on the internet. And she wrote back and said, somebody ought to write a book about your mother. And I said to myself, okay, I'll do it. I had asked mother in her 70s, to write her own story. And she just never could get to, interested enough about herself to do that. And then my, one of my older sisters, Sally, the one I mentioned, she wrote a, a charming little book. And I thought, she'll write a book about mother. She never did. So here it was, somebody saying, somebody ought to write a book about your mother. So I said to Hugh, OK, I'm going to do it. And it, it was just a split. Decision, and then we got. I got started writing on it, and uh, it was pretty awful at the beginning, <laughs> and quite repetitive. And Hugh straightened me out. Yes, way back there. Yeah, you said that your father originally started flying. Did he pursue it beyond, or once your mother got really into it, did he just let it be her her interest? He. Uh, my father did have an interest in flying and was taking flying lessons. Did he, what did he do with that in his life? He turned it over to my mother. He, he uh, had solar hours, but he never got his license. Um, you know, he, he was fascinated by aviation. He um, flew in the dirigible uh, across the Atlantic. And um, yeah, when the t in those days, tickets cost $3,000, which is about $50,000 today. Um, so he um, didn't mind spending a little of his extra cash on things like that. But he, he um, actually, he really, uh, during the war, he took a, um, a volunteer post in DC, and my mother would fly him down for his meetings. He loved that. Yeah, wait for him to finish and bring him back home. After the airplane registration was handed in, Yes. It became the registration of a, a blimp or a dirigible. Yes. Owned by Westinghouse Electric. Yeah. Right. Glad you know that. Yeah. And it, yes. So, uh, you saw, uh, some, um, I think they are very much of the same age, more or less. Uh, your mother with uh, Beryl Markham. Mark. Oh, Beryl Markham. Uh, what is uh, the. Do you know that? You um, know? I, uh, I never heard Beryl Markham's name mentioned in the family, so I don't yeah. think they knew each other. Yeah, because they are the same and they, age. Of right, but they were, yeah, but one was she living. She was in Africa, but uh, she was so, uh, in the uh, UK. And, uh, she was, in, uh, in, right. Uh, and have you read her book, Fly by, what is it called, Fly by West? West. 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 Yeah. Yeah, have you read Beryl Mar Markham's book? Yeah, it's isn't it wonderful? It's a wonderful mm -hmm. book. Yeah. So. No, they did, I don't think they did knew she each other. Amelia and um, no. no, she was about ten years behind. She died and they, at thirty-seven. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. So. Yeah. So that was very sad. So any other thoughts? And yes, way back there. Oh, I see. Do you live in Lexington? Yes. This gentleman is saying that in Lexington, the Historical Society has, has a way to, to um, amalgamate records and, and uh, keep them for posterity. It's 
so a suggestion of what to do. I've been sending most uh, most everything to the Noldy Forest Educational Environmental Center, uh, as well as to the um, Reading, Pennsylvania, Berks County Historical Society. Yes. Have you sent anything to the 99s? I've sent. Have I sent anything to the 99s? No. I have, I've tried a couple of times to reach people at the 99s, and um, I haven't. Got, Thank you. The one thing that, that, that did happen is I found someone who writes for the magazine. I can't remember the title. And there's different writers. Yeah, this is a woman in Texas. And she, I read the book, wrote a review, and it's, she said it's going to be published in the January, February issue. And it was. Oh, and it was. OK. Okay, lovely. But I'd, I'd love further contact with, with the 99s. My mother loved the 99s um, as a women's organization, and she supported it um, always. We always would talk about the 99s and being a 99er. Yeah, it was great fun. Yeah, great. Yes, John. How tough was your editor? How tough was my editor? <laughs> my editor is a, is, uh, was John's English teacher at school, and he offered three methods of working with me. One is really easy, very, very light, just commas and maybe typos, that kind of thing. The second would be looking for a few grammatical things, but um, still not too tough. And the third is go for everything. Guess what I chose? Go for everything. And I'm so glad I did because Hugh's, uh, his insight, his kindness, his wisdom, his humor is, is throughout all the pages. I mean, I'm taking credit for it, but it really belongs to Hugh. Yeah, it's true. Yay. <laughs> so, and I will add that we did not need couples counseling. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're at all interested in finding a copy of the book for your oh, I got too close to that. I'm so sorry. So sorry. Um, take, take one of these cards. I really am promoting an independent bookstore, which is in Acton, Massachusetts. It's West Acton. And uh, it's called the Silver Unicorn Bookstore. And you can go online. Just do Silver Unicorn Books books.com. Up comes um, the website. Click on the website and put the title of the book in, and they will ship it to you. You can do the same on Amazon, but Amazon's a headache um, from, from the standpoint of a seller. It's wonderful for a buyer, but um, I really like to support the independent bookstores. So, and and um, you had asked a question earlier about the fact that my mother's name was Francis Dean Wilcox Noldy, and I'm Francis Dean Noldy, and kind of how does that happen? So um, I was named after my mother without the Wilcox. And um, after I, I was married and divorced and had a couple kids, and then I, I decided to reclaim my family history and my family connection, and the way to, I had to go through a, quite a long process of doing that to feel good about it, and I took my family name back. And I've kept it ever since, even though I'm married to wonderful Hugh Fort Miller. <laughs> yeah, so thank you for that question. Yeah. Any last comments before we close? No. Thank you for coming. And Beautiful. Yeah. Really, really nice job. Just a big thank you, Francie. Thanks you for, so much for writing the book and, and for joining us tonight to talk to you about it and to your editor and yeah. contributor and, and better half as well. Um, a reminder that, uh, first of all, thanks so much for being here. It is just such a treat to be in person and not doing a thing where you sit in your pajamas in front of your TV screen or a computer screen doing a Zoom, um, another Zoom. So thank you so much for being here tonight in person. A reminder that next month uh, we are going to do another one of those Zooms. It's a virtual icebreaker with Victoria Yeager, uh, the widow of Chuck Yeager, who is going to talk about... Uh, uh, Chuck Yeager and the book that they wrote together called Yeagerism. She's in California, which is and, and won't be traveling here, which is the reason we're going to do that virtually. So that'll be next month, I think the 15th 
or so of, oh yeah, 15th of, uh, of February. And then in March, a reminder about our crash course, which will be taking place just up the street at the Burlington Marriott. Um, that's going to be Wednesday, March 15th. Please join us for that event. It's a really tremendous event. Uh, Administrator D'Alessandro, Stephen K. Brown from the Fast Stream, and Richard McSpadden, always an incredible presenter from uh, the Air Safety Institute, will be joining us as well. So we hope you'll make plans to attend. Again, thank you, Francie, for being here. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Have a great night. Thank you so much. Thank you.